The name William Brownrigg and his publication, The Art of Making Common Salt, was published in 1748, crops up through a number of talks in this first Scottish Salt Symposium. And this quote's worth taking notice of because at that date he was saying that the practice of so many ages for an art so simple and withal so necessary hath not yet been brought to any great degree of perfection. And he goes through with numerous references uh, to catalogue the development of salt making and to give his views on how the uh, salt industry could adapt its methods and make the kind of salts that were necessary, particularly for things like the fishing industry. Thomas Lowndes, who we'll also hear of later in this talk, uh, published a similar paper in 1748. And a predecessor, John Collins, in his work, Salt and Fishery, was making the same comments uh, in 1682. And a further review of the developments of the salt industry are made, made by Calvert in his huge volume, Salt in Cheshire, published in 1915. Joe Hambley wanted me to um, introduce a wider perspective on salt making uh, to follow up on the more detailed localised descriptions uh, that form part of the rest of the symposium. But it's a huge, huge topic and the processes are, are many and varied um, and even similar processes in different locations are carried on in a slightly different way. So we have solar, partial solar, sand washing and sleaching, open pan and direct boiling, graduated boiling, have a salt on salt process, salt refineries and va eventually vacuum evaporation. The materials used um, can involve um, ceramics, lead, iron and stainless steel and uh, more recently things like monel metal uh, for vacuum evaporators and the heat sources can be the sun, the wind, peat, wood, coal, uh, secondary heat sources, um, as we heard um, from Ireland, where they were using the waste heat from lime kilns to evaporate brine uh, and get a secondary product, product out of a primary heat source. And more recently, things like gas and electricity. But everybody uh, starts off initially with a weak brine, even in inland salt producing places like Droitwich and Northwich. Brine was contaminated at the surface by groundwater and wasn't the saturated brine uh, that we know today in those areas. And so the art was actually in pre-concentrating the brine, uh, either by solar concentrations, by sleaching through a salt-on-salt salt salt process. Um, and then after the 16th century, uh, where you could bring saturated solutions to the, directly to the surface from the brine streams. Um, so all of the interest, in my view, is actually getting a weak brine to a concentrated level whereby uh, you can make white salt more economically. Of course, finding coal uh, suddenly brought a, a cheap heat source uh, and the process of direct boiling uh, and uh, boiling neat seawater directly through to um, crystallisation. Um, was perhaps the very first start uh, of the climate change um, uh, in, in, um, as a result of uh, large scale um, salt evaporations that we'll see later. And these produce white salt. But after the um, 1670 uh, in Northwich, rock salt was discovered and that was added uh, to the salt on salt process and through dissolving uh, carrying rock salt around the country and dissolving it in seawater, uh, that produced uh, a, an artificial, as it were, uh, salt solution that then could be turned into white salt. Nowadays, the majority of that rock salt is used on the roads for de-icing. And over the time that I worked um, for Bayroll Borough Council uh, on the uh, uh, scheme to restore and conserve and open the Lion Salt Works in Northwich, as a museum, I had the opportunity to experiment with a whole variety of these processes, uh, making ceramic salt pans, and looking at how the different firings of brine containers could affect the drying and storage of, of salt within 
Ryan Cups uh, in the slide on the left, um, working with Tom Lane uh, on reconstructions of the Ingermell salt pans uh, to determine how they might have actually been used um, with uh, a, a furnace arrangement whereby the pans are almost heated by hot air rather than directly by the flames. I've made uh, two lead salt pans and in 2003 um, when our project was on BBC's restoration uh, program, um, we uh, made a pan and had a reenactment with the Irm Street Guard uh, it, it, it behind the, the Lion Salt Works in Northwich. And we've made uh, a, a small scale replica of Agricola's uh, line drawing um, published in 1565 to actually see how that might have worked. I've built a Selena in my own garden, um, carrying seawater uh, from the beach uh, in Anglesey uh, and seeing how uh, you can concentrate the brine uh, to replicate um, a Mediterranean or Atlantic coast uh, Selena uh, on a very small scale, increasing the percentage uh, as the brine evaporated and is passed from um, collection uh, one set of collection pans into another. And also a brine graduation tower for Science Week in 2006, uh, with the help uh, of Jules Lugels, who came over from Gotteskarbe Salt Works in Rhina in Germany. Uh, we built a small replica uh, graduation tower. Um, and you can look up the various YouTube links uh, to, to see how, how that worked. So if we come now to a contemporary of William Brown Riggs, 1748, Thomas Lands of Cheshire. And he was trying to encourage uh, an increase in English uh, salt making so that we didn't have to import as much salt from overseas. His paper, Brine Salt Improved, or a method for making salt from brine that shall be as good or better than French bay salt. And uh, I always love uh, his description of French bay salt. He says it's always mixed with dirt and nastiness which make of a full seventh part and the filth arises from putrefied human bodies, dead fish and the carcasses of animal and from immense quantities of different kinds of rotten weeds together with the innumerable other unwholesome mixtures brought into the Salinas by the tide. How wonderful the salt would be to be made in England, uh, particularly um, by rock salt uh, in Cheshire rather than uh, importing all of this horrible salt uh, from overseas. However, this is the reality of what was produced in Cheshire as production increased. All of those salt pans burning cheap coal and covering the countryside in smoke. In 1915, Calvert, in his book Salt in Cheshire, Cheshire describes the effect on the Cheshire salt towns. Northwich and Winsford are best known by the story and pictures of the melancholy consequences of their commercial prosperity. Consequences which are everywhere visible in the intrusive lakes and gaping fissures which scar the face of the countryside and in the crazy and dilapidated buildings that disfigure the streets. You can see a postcard on the left hand sides with these leaning buildings specially designed as timber frame buildings uh, so that uh, they wouldn't actually collapse as they uh, leant over the ground disappeared beneath them. And Northwich was a tourist attraction for people to come and look uh, at the horrible conditions that people had to live in uh, who worked in the salt industry. The effect on the landscape was widespread within a localised area because weak brine as it moved through the brine streams didn't dissolve uh, uh, enough salt until it got farther down the streams. Uh, it uh, took on more salt and more salt and gradually the cavities got larger and also um, they undermined the top bed rock salt mines that had created large cavities uh, closer to the surface and these collapsed. In Manchester Evening News it says every blade of grass in the vicinity is being killed off and the hillsides and fields are reduced to bare surfaces of baked clay. Uh, 
Thomas Ward, who worked for the Thompson family who owned the Lion Salt Works, said that when the end of the world come, it will look like this, but with fire and brimstone on wa not water. Preachers would come down to Manchester and preach hellfire and damnation uh, about what would happen when the end of the world came. Brownrigg has a number of illustrations, many of which uh, have been used uh, in other people's reports, and you will have seen them in other presentations during this symposium. He wrote about thing, how things used to be, and this is Brownrigg's plate of 1748, plate one. And as was mentioned in the talk from St. Monans, this is actually cribbed from Agricola, published in 1556 in De Re Metallica. He's had it re-engraved, he's flipped it uh, around, but we see a salt maker with his assistant uh, with one of these iron pans supported by iron hooks to a wooden framework. He does the same thing uh, by reproducing uh, the uh, iron salt pans that were brought in uh, in the Cheshire area, this time reproducing Dr William Jackson's um, illustration published in 1669 in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. Again, it's been flipped uh, ar around, uh, but it uh, takes all of the, the same essential uh, information and publishes it about how things used to be. Brown was trying to say that this is how things were done in the past. And he produces a set of plans and elevations for a modern salt works. And this one here has different designs for flues. Uh, his salt pan still has uh, a framework over the top of it with hooks supporting the bottom plates. Um, but it's a modern version. And the animation here uh, is my uh, adaptation of his plans and sections to see whether this could actually be turned into a working salt works. Here we have the front of the hearth area showing the grates and the firebox and the ash box underneath. The staircase coming uh, along the left hand side up to the salt pan. We have the chimney at the end uh, taking away all of the smoke. Next to this uh, brine pan is a storage system where the seawater has been pumped up from the foreshore and then fed by gravity in the pans. The firing area is in the centre so that firemen can work both sets of pans on either side of the building. In 1631, a model of a salt pan um, was sent to Lord Lowther. Uh, it remains, probably still remain, remains underneath Whitehaven Pier. And this was published as long ago as 1975 in the Colchester um, Archaeology Group Symposium, the study of an ancient industry. And the accounts for the works have been written up uh, by Blake Tyson in 1999, published in the Transactions, Transactions of Cumberland and Westmoreland. Um, it shows uh, a pan house uh, with pairs of pans, um, but it also describes um, a cistern, a set of upper and lower cisterns, um, a brine tank um, with adjacent warehouses. We colour code these. Um, the salt pans are in pink. The brine cistern reservoir is um, in blue and there's a pale pink area in the top right hand corner which is labelled for basal because part of this process uh, could involve uh, the mixing of the seawater with imported basalt as a salt on salt process and the three systems that are described are for putting uh, in the basalt into the um, seawater and the feeding of pipes uh, may well be like the one uh, shown in this uh, original from Stuttgart of 1595 uh, to feed the brine into the individual systems. 
Again, I've animated this model to show sets of salt pans with hearths and ash boxes underneath um, with three cisterns and pumps sucking the brine up to the middle cistern, mixing it with bay salt in the bottom and then pimping it, pumping it up uh, to an upper cistern from where it can be fed by gravity into the salt pans on the uh, each side of the pan house, each with their individual chimney. And the warehouse area is on the left hand side uh, of the uh, complete building. So we've got brine input and basalt in the right hand side of the building, mixing area and then pipes distributing the brine through to the salt pans and then the completed uh, white salt crystals taking into drying and storage areas uh, at the left hand side of the building. And that arrangement of um, pans being fed by uh, a, in this case, timber gutter um, is described in the uh, Trife Melgrin accounts of 1566, where they specify that there should be a sweep and a bucket to carry the brine up from the store seawater brine lagoon uh, into the distribution trough. Um, and these have been seen in talks uh, by Chris Watley uh, and the talk by Kenzie, uh, where this uh, system is called a wand and a bucket. And the 16th century description says that this is used as they do in London in the dyeing and brewing industries. Brereton from Cheshire uh, made tours of uh, Holland and uh, Scotland, England and Ireland in 1635. His brother had a salt pan on the north side of Northwich, so he understand what the process was. And he describes what he saw uh, in South Shields. There are 24 pans that have 12 furnaces and 12 fires, and they're erected in a manner all being square and of like proportion, and they're placed two and two together, one against each other, the six pans in the highest rank and the bottom equal with the top of the lower. And again, my model shows how I think that this was constructed with sets of pairs of pans, with the furnace evaporating the raw seawater and passing the concentrated brown down into the lower pan. So you'd be filling up the uh, raw seawater pan uh, many times, perhaps uh, three or four times, and passing the concentrated brine down into the lower pan. And the waste heat uh, that has evaporated the seawater is passed underneath the lower pan and allows that stronger brine to crystallise out using the heat as a secondary source. And there are dampers uh, that are able to be raised and lowered in the base of the chimneys uh, to adjust the draw of the fire underneath both pans. A number of times uh, we've also heard about how the Cheshiron industry uh, began to affect um, the capabilities or the capacity uh, of small local salt uh, works in Scotland. Um, this is showing um, the output uh, from uh, of salt uh, put together by Charles Foster in 2004, sowing shipments from the port of Frodsham. And you can see uh, that there uh, is uh, here the magic date of 1670 when rock salt was first discovered. And you can see that there's some 20 years uh, before any significant output uh, from Frodsham by ships uh, can be noticed. And then there's a war with France and William and Mary come to the throne and you can see this huge rise and the fact that salt starts to be taxed in order to pay, pay for these wars. And alongside this, I put some other notable dates in. Um, Limington in 1625 uh, changed from using a sleaching process to an open pan process. The salt pan that we saw described uh, by William Brereton in Shields uh, was in 1635. 
it wasn't until 1650 down here uh, that Northwich first began making salt all year round. Prior to that, it was still a seasonal occupation. John Collins's work uh, to improve the salting of fish uh, in England um, from making salt in England rather than import it is written in 1682. Um, and the Weaver Navigation Acts come in in 1720. And um, brine, strong brine, isn't found in Droitwich until 1725. But what a difference um, that strong brine and the connection through the Weaver navigation made to Northwich. And if you describe the St. Monan's pans as being the Amazon version, um, these are probably the intergalactic version because these are just two aerial photographs of salt pans in the Winsford area and the resultant smoke that was described um, by Calvert. And you've got to add to that salt pans from Northwich, uh, the pan complexes in Middlewich, Stafford, and later in Droitwich. So this huge output uh, of white salt made from saturated brine uh, with the advantage of cheap transport. And it's little wonder that small industries around the country couldn't compete on price and could buy salt more cheaply than they could make it themselves. In 1933, um, which I, uh, an article uh, or a lecture given by uh, W.J. Parker uh, of the Salt Union, um, was I've reprinted this in the newsletter for EcoSal Salt Coat Number Six, um, and he says in a, that in a speech given by Mr. Malcolm, who was latterly the chief engineer and managing director of the Salt Union, that Malcolm uh, told Northwich Rotarians um, that speaking of the old salt pans, that when he first saw one of them, he thought to himself, here is plenty of room for improvement. But it wasn't long before he discovered he'd made a great mistake and that it was an amazingly efficient evaporator. So from Brownrigg in 1748, to 1933, there had been changes in the simple process of putting brine into a metal pan and evaporating it to a point that in 1933, it was felt that the process could not no longer be improved. Lion Salt Works, I'll use an example, but this is only the last surviving open pan salt works, not necessarily the most efficient uh, or economic one. Um, the industrial ones created by the Salt Union um, uh, were perhaps better designed, but this was a small family works and perhaps looks back to an earlier generation, consisting of a complex of pan houses and stove houses. Um, the variety of salt that could be made here uh, was quite enormous. Lots of the smaller pans that we've seen in Scotland don't include drying areas. And that was fundamental for some of the types of salt that were made. Chiefly, the fishing salt could be made outdoors and didn't need to be stove dried. But some of the other salt products did. You could also see the family nature of the salt works here um, with this painting in Salford City Art Gallery drawn by Philip Holman uh, Miller. In um, 2000, uh, my wife Annelise edited a set of memoirs that had been written by Tom Lightfoot, who recently retired uh, from where well, he uh, he'd been encouraged on his retirement by George Twig and Lady Rochester, who'd set up the Northwich Salt Museum to write about his memoirs. He'd worked for uh, on the river, distributing salts down the River Weaver, and then latterly at Murgatroyd Salt Works, where he ended his days working at, in charge of the brine pump uh, that's recently been restored by the Middlewich Heritage Trust. And he describes uh, how the, the pans were built and how they were operated. Um, this one shows the layout of the pan houses and the drying stores. And in this particular uh, variant, the chimney is placed in the center of the structure between the salt pan 
and the drying store. At the Lion Salt Works, the chimneys for all the pans is at the far end so that the heat travels in one direction. But in this version, the heat from the furnace, the flues on the left hand side, is drawn uh, underneath the salt pan and then down the outside wall of the drying store and comes along the end of the pan house and back down the centre to try and even up the temperature. So the hot air is against the cold outer walls of the salt pan and as it cools down it's then returned uh, back down the middle. Uh, but that keeps this central storage uh, area to dry the salt and then to warehouse it on the floor above. Uh, very hot. You'll also see in the salt pan um, that the pan's supported by rows of flues running the length uh, of the pan house or the length, length of the pan. On the, each side though there's a dead draft so that when you're drawing salt to the sides of the salt pan ready to be lifted out with your skimmer as we can see with the uh, lumpman raking the salt on the front cover of the booklet, uh, salt that sits on the side of the pan isn't um, actually heated directly by the fires underneath. There's cool air underneath here so that it doesn't burn onto the bottom of the pan at the sides. And then these would be operated over a week. At the end of a week, um, the bitter salts would be drained off and the job of picking the pans uh, could begin until they were refilled uh, on Monday afternoon. Um, this involved a picking tool and probably the largest sledgehammer that you could get hold of. And it said that you could hear this, you know, people knocking seven bells out of the bottom of an iron pan could be heard all over the villages. We'd also heard about lifting a pan. All the pans that we've seen from the Scottish salt works were relatively small. In these large pans that are over 20 foot wide and 30 to 40 foot long, or in the case of a fishery pan, 60 foot long, um, they were very heavy indeed. But by putting this long arm and using a ratchet, you could gradually ratchet the side of the pan up. But you did that by standing inside the pan. So not only were you lifting the weight of the pan, but this, you're lifting the weight of the people operating the jigger tool at the same time. The pans were then lifted at one side or at one end and chocks were put underneath and then repairs were carried out, uh, perhaps replacing rivets with the riveters on the top and somebody using a holder upper, which is this thing here, being levered against this block to hold up the uh, bottom rivet so that the riveters could hammer the head down on the inside. You'll not be surprised to hear that there are numerous accidents where people get crushed and injured as salt pans fell on them while this operation was taking place. This um, little uh, record slip for the Lion Salt Works also shows us a disposition of different types of pans at the works before it was converted purely to fine pan making. It's showing a set of four fishery pans set up outside and three fine pans where the salt pans are under cover and they have adjacent warehouses and stove houses. And it has a list for stocks of the different types of salt that could be made. Common salt, fishery salt, butter salt, different types of shoots and blocks of salt, uh, hand it squares, uh, and also the fuel that remained at the salt works. So four fishery pans, four fine pans, and I put a red line for where the heat is. And notice here that the furnace uh, were operated by firemen, just as we saw in brown rig. So uh, one or two firemen could actually take coal and shovel it into furnaces on either side of them. These are the different types of salt that were made at an open pan salt works in Cheshire. This is a photograph from Calvert 1915, showing table salt, dairy salt, common salt, two types of common salt, two types of fishery salt, and block salt, which is something that the Thompson family at the Lion Salt Works specialised in. So here we have common salt, fishery salt, Block salt, 
And I'll come back to this drawing, this uh, postcard, which men mentions col co uh, common salt in a moment. But there are different types of handed squares that are put down here. They're called 160s or 80s, and that refers to the number of tubs that were needed to make one ton of salt. So 180 squares to make a ton or 80 squares to make a ton. If you got the type of salt crystal wrong, uh, that you were boiling in your pan, you would have either too many squares per ton or too few, and the client wouldn't accept them. So the skill in getting the right temperature and drawing the salt out at the right time to make the right type of product was vital for the process. Also vital was actually making these different grades of salt by getting the temperatures in the pan correct. The postcard here from Thomas Hassel says that his boats, Ted and Willie, uh, will be at Northwich and he asks them to provide Friday morning back ends Marston Common because the Thompsons had works in other places apart from Marston. So he's sending it to the office. He wants salt from Marston. He want, wants back ends common. So we want common salt rather than fine salt or coarse salt. And he wants it from the back end of the pan. So the hot end of the pan, um, very often that is where the, the most amount of pan scale would burn onto the uh, bottom of the pan. So by drawing it from the back end, you might incorporate fewer pieces of pan scale than you would. And he wants it from Friday morning because the pans were set up so that they set up the highest temperatures uh, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, when you were making the fine salt, which included the block salt but you didn't want to throw away boiling brine. So from Thursday, you let the pan start to cool down. So you're making variations of common salt on Thursday afternoon, Thursday nights, and Fridays. So just that simple statement, Friday morning, back end common, tells the Thompsons what kind of salt that the boats Ted and Willie are expecting to collect. And Thompson's carried on making block salt and they uh, cut it down to make small bagged cut lump salt as their speciality. Jonathan Thompson coined the phrase a natural product produced in a traditional way with nothing added and nothing taken away. And I think that some of those words are used uh, by modern artisan salt makers today. But by uh, 1986, this product was seen as old fashioned grocers didn't want to stock it. Customers that used it traditionally were dying out and the artisan salt works had not yet been uh, established. And so with additional works still or repairs being need, needed on salt pans, um, Jonathan's uh, uncle uh, Henry Lloyd Thompson at retirement age, it was decided that the works would close. So the products that were replacing them were things uh, from vacuum uh, works, um, Sarah Bross, uh, Morton's from America, and they're using slogans, see how it runs, when it rains, it pours, because they're using anti-caking agents, the variety of different types here. The ones probably you're most used to are sodium hexacyanoferrate, um, because people didn't want to put sodium ferrocyanide on the side of a food product. Um, but you'll also find magnesium carbonate and calcium carbonate, uh, particularly on salts that were sold as cooking salt rather than table salt. We must also uh, just make a quick mention of the fact that apart from open pan salt making and evaporation, um, that there is still a rock salt industry in the UK and that the Winsford Rock Salt Mine was operated by the salt union that were also operating open pan salt works. And that uh, Cheshire also saw the introduction uh, of vacuum evaporation. The one on the left is about 1900 of a, an early evaporator built in Runcorn in Cheshire. And the ones on the right are the modern uh, stainless steel uh, Monel evaporators of British salt, now Tartar uh, chemicals in Middlewich. Uh, where by evaporating six chambers uh, with one lot of steam sequentially uh, significantly reduces the uh, environmental impact of 
fuel on the whole process. As mentioned earlier uh, in one of the talks as part of the symposium, uh, that rock salt, uh, that um, vacuum salt crystals were round. And we can see from this slide, this is a mixture of vacuum salt crystals. Um, these are here are round ones and these are square because they're actually spun out by centrifuge of the vacuum evaporators at a different point in production. Usually to be really efficient, uh, not only is the steam passed from chamber to chamber, but the salt is as well. As it circulates within the chambers, the corners of the square crystals are knocked off uh, to make round crystals. But it's possible to spin um, the, the salt out from each chamber individually, in which case you can still retain the square crystal shape of 99.9% .9 sodium chloride because the brine entering the system uh, is purified. The anti-caking agent uh, is now put in to stop all these crystals sticking together. But in the early form of their operation, they were used, the anti-caking agent, um, sodium hexacyanoferrid, was added uh, to try and replicate uh, an open pan salt crystal. And it was called dendritic salt because the additive stopped the square crystals from forming and created fingers uh, on the sides of the salt crystals that replicated the type of crystals that were made in an open pan that was useful for the fishing and uh, leather industries. And in fact, different types of these vacuum evaporating uh, salts uh, are used for different purposes. Uh, it, it's like having uh, a bag of balls and throwing them, throwing them across the floor or a bag of bricks and throwing them off, uh, across the floor. One is much more free running than the other. And so the vacuum chambers are set up, the production is set up to make different grades of salt, mainly for industrial users. And it's a very, very small quantity uh, of the salt that's made uh, here that actually ends up as table salt on a supermarket shelf. So I hope that that's covered uh, a vast uh, area uh, of the development of uh, salt making processes. Um, I am still trying to get funding to develop uh, a 3D saltworks project that will link all of the uh, basic documentary source material and turn those into 3D working saltworks so that we can compare all of these processes, all their activities and the historical timeline in which they're set in a logical and straightforward way. Um, uh, in the drawing that we have here showing the locations and the prime sources is part of an interactive uh, iBook that I've been developing uh, to try and link all of these uh, projects together. And if you want uh, a summary uh, of the salt industry, it's still possible to get a print on demand version of the book that Annalise and I wrote uh, for Shire Books uh, in 2006. Uh, and you can have one ordered now and printed for you and sent to you by post. And if you go on to uh, the EcoSAL website um, or contact us, we can email you our newsletters. They're, they're also available online or you can find our uh, Google map, uh, which is uh, looking at putting a whole variety of salt making and salt cultural associations uh, onto uh, an interactive map. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Thank you very much.